next 15 years will see a remarkable proliferation of commercial opportunities in space, from asteroid mining to orbital tourism. Now, I recently spoke with Mike Greenlee of MDA Corporation about those opportunities and to George Randall of Siemens PLM about the systems challenges that engineers will have to overcome to make those opportunities a reality. Let's hear from Mike how MDA enables commercialization of orbital space. Uh, today we uh, are provide a lot of support to the global international space community in the areas of satellite ground systems, satellite components, electronics, payloads and antennas, um, in addition to robotics and sensors for space exploration vehicles. Satellites, of course, it's big business, it's getting bigger. I mean, the payloads themselves are getting heavier. I mean, uh, I'm amazed there's any space at all left in geosynchronous orbit to do this, but we have new generations of sort of low orbiting uh, constellations or clouds Absolutely. of satellites coming in down there. Uh, where's the future, do you think? Where's the, where's the, the business going to be, say, 10, 20 years from now? There's two elements right now that we talk about in terms of the new space economy. So one is the economy in low Earth orbit. As you mentioned, there's a bit of a shift from geosynchronous orbit closer to Earth and low Earth orbit, where our current International Space Station, for example, would orbit about 400 to 600 kilometers from Earth. In that, in that orbit, um, we're seeing a lot of commercial activity. So the barriers to entry now are quite low. Many, many companies can now get access to a rocket for launch and put a satellite in orbit for Earth observation, for communications, for tracking things, or what have you. We see about 2,800 objects in orbit right now, with uh, various studies showing us getting up to 17, 20,000 objects in orbit over the next uh, 10 to 15 years. So there's a whole market there then to provide the elements of that um, satellite market. Um, as a result of that, there's also an emerging market for on-orbit servicing where people can build satellites or spacecraft to go up and inspect, repair, uh, and sometimes refuel, or to move around, change the orbit or deorbit a satellite to get it out of the way. So that's a brand new market, first market study ever in 2018, as a $3 billion market in the next decade. So you see a, a good market in low Earth orbit. And you see two other things, space tourism, with space tourism expected to be over a billion dollar industry, according to an FAA recent study, and then space mining where one asteroid the size of a football field could have $20 billion worth of minerals on it. And there's about 18,000 of those types of asteroids that are accessible from Earth. So there's an burgeoning market um, with a number of different countries that are investing in their industrial bases, taking mining technologies from Earth and adapting them for space mining of the future. Now, Mike, uh, you're talking about asteroid mining, satellite servicing, geosynchronous orbit, for example, that's 22,300 miles up. So we don't think of this the kind of thing that an astronaut in a suit is going to go and do. We must be talking about robotics here. Will this be automated servicing, automated mining, do you think? In 2022, 2024, we'll start to be back in the moon with a new space station that's going to orbit the moon. So our current space station is 400 kilometers from Earth. Our new space station will be 400,000 kilometers from Earth orbiting the moon. And definitely it's going to have a lot of robotics in it and automation uh, to provide the support to people who will, astronauts who will now live on the moon, uh, driving around in their rovers and doing exploration and science, getting support from this new space station. So uh, an incredible amount of robotics that will be proven out on the way to Mars uh, 10 to 12 years from now when those next generation of space explorations will go from the moon to Mars and even more robotics and automation will be a part of that. So artificially intelligence driven next generation robotics is absolutely the centerpiece of the next generation of space exploration. Now Mike, you mentioned AI, uh, the moon quarter million miles away, a little bit of latency. Asteroid mining, the asteroid belt, a lot of latency. Right. So in terms of remote control, are these things really going to be on their own or have to think on their own up there? They will, yeah. And, and if you look at some of the orbits around the moon, for example, for the new space station, um, you can go several days of being out of touch. So you have to send a command to say, I want these tasks completed and then you might lose contact for a few days and the, the artificial intelligence will be leading those tasks with fail-safe modes, but if something goes wrong, it'll just pause. And you'll get it back when it comes around the moon and it'll be paused if something went wrong. But largely, you're gonna have its own brain that uh, you know, is running its uh, instructions that you've given it with an artificial intelligence engine. Um, a tremendous level of advancement compared to what we do today. To achieve that level of robotics um, is, is the challenge sensors, actuators, structures, software, on the robotics elements itself, because we've got you know 30 years of experience now in space robotics, the actual mechanical and structural elements of that, the actuators, the control systems, we have a lot of proven technology there that we can reuse and or introduce the next generation of uh, those product lines. The biggest challenge is you know introducing the next generation of artificial intelligence into those control loops uh, and massively um, advancing the level of autonomy of the robotics tasks. George Randell of Siemens PLM gave us some insights into the capabilities of new design software that will be helping teams develop the systems of systems required to develop this new era of autonomous space vehicles. Uh, George, aerospace, of course, aerospace we think of structures, 
large pieces of hardware. The aerospace industry has advanced electronics, it has structures, essentially it has sensors, actuators, or software, so it's sort of all-encompassing sort, of, sort of industry at this point. How do they get these folks to talk to each other? I come from a world where the structures yeah. guys never talk to software guys, they never talk to electronics guys. This point. Is, is PLM the key to making that work, do you think? Uh, yes, we do believe it's the key. Uh, of course, as you mentioned, aerospace structures and the products of the aerospace industry are really systems of systems. The impressive thing is the size and scale, and of course there's human safety factors and a whole bunch of other complexity that goes into those products. Some of the things that we're doing recently at Siemens PLM Software is the merger acquisition with Mentor Graphics. So with our NX Mechanical CAD software, we're tying the mechanical pieces to the Mentor Graphics Capital Electronic Systems. That allows our aerospace customers to mix and integrate the workflow to and from electrical and mechanical CAD to a single customer workflow and end-to-end -end process. What we have today in our current NX12 release with Mentor Capital and also with Mentor Expedition is cross-probing and integration of that data. So whether the mechanical CAD and electrical CAD user is the same user, perhaps at a medium or supplier aerospace company, or they're two different folks in a big enterprise aerospace company, that data moves back and forth without data translation and allows the mechanical CAD user to see the mechanical structure, the envelope for enclosure, and do what we call cross-probing to the logical schematics or to the cable and electrical routing on the mentor side and allows that to go back and forth the other direction. The key to that success is our team center backbone for PLM, which integrates all those users in an overall customer product lifecycle management solution. Generative design and topology optimization are excellent tools for space applications because they can help tremendously with light weighting, particularly when paired with additive manufacturing. Now I asked George what he sees as the future of software development that will support these efforts. Pie in the sky, you know, everything is coming to be. Uh, from our perspective, perhaps not quite out 10 years, but a little bit closer in time, the additive manufacturing and additive design is happening right now. Lattice structures, topology optimization, generative um, design, complementing the manual uh, design from engineers. All of that, we have initial product releases in NX today to provide solutions, but I think that's an area of rapid innovation and it's gonna change drastically over the next two to three years. A prediction, how long? How long do you think from the point at which we see, for example, perhaps um, robotic um, orbital servicing, and then perhaps the next step, the moon, and then asteroids. Yeah, on-orbit servicing, uh, first projects uh, launched in 2020. Um, some of those are our customers, um, which is really good to see. Um, the um, new space station for the moon is currently targeted, the Lunar Gateway, is currently targeted for uh, 2024. And then most of the conversations around the first uh, you know, human missions towards Mars is in that 2030 timeframe, so not too far away. So those are the predictions are Mike Greenlee and George Randell. We'll have asteroid mining and human missions to Mars faster than you think, and we'll have sophisticated software environments that will enable users to pass data rather than files between mechanical, electrical, and electronics designers to make those complex system of systems fly. It's an exciting time to be an engineer.